Good morning, and welcome to worship at the Western United Methodist Church on this Sunday, July 12, 2020. It's an honor and joy to be able to be together. We have a few announcements to share following worship this morning. We will join for Cap Coffee Fellowship on Zoom at 11.30, but if you'd like to fellowship together in person, we will be gathering together in the parking lot of the church here at noontime. So bring your own coffee, bring your own food, and um, we'll be marking off parking spaces so that we can have an opportunity to sit at a safe distance from one another and yet still visit with each other. So that's an opportunity as well. The um, directions to how to get to the Coffee Fellowship Zoom are available in our newsletter, The Beams, and also in the bulletin, both of which went out by email this week. The Beams is available on our website and on our Facebook page, So, on, and that information is there for you. Coming up on Tuesday, we have uh, finished our Bible study journey through the Psalms last Tuesday, but we're going to continue to meet on Tuesdays during this summer as we have continued to have this safe distance from one another. So 7 o'clock on Tuesdays, we'll gather for conversation, sometimes informal conversation, and sometimes there'll be a topic to discuss together. I hope that you'll be able to join us, and that information is also available in the Beams and on the website. Anyone is welcome. Please feel free to take the time. You can come as you are, come when you can. If you can't come every week, don't worry about that. Come when you can. We have got our prayer box and our Bible box, Bible book stand available um, up and running this week. So there are Bibles and there are books available there for you to come and pick up, help yourself. There is a little box on the side where you can put your prayer requests. And our prayer group meets every Wednesday at noon to pray for those prayer requests. So I hope that you will find that to be an opportunity to get an opportunity to be in prayer with others and to know that others are praying for you. Our church council meeting this week will be on Wednesday evening and the trustees will meet on Thursday evening and our re-entry team meets on Tuesday morning. Um, and I think those are the announcements for this morning. I pray that we are all richly blessed as we worship together today and invite you now to prepare your hearts for worship as we listen to this morning's prayer. behind us and walk into these new days of ministry. Sometimes you rather remember how things used to be. Sometimes you're afraid to be disciples. But this is a new day, and Christ is sharing freedom with us. It is a day to put aside all fear, to leave doubting behind, and to take courage in God's loving call. We will look to the new day and we will set ourselves on the Jerusalem road. We will strive for faithfulness, and we will be disciples, renewing and healing the world around us. Let us pray. God of the sojourners, we ask your presence with us on our journey through life. Help us to be faithful to your ways of love and grace. Keep us from despair. Give us the power to make your love known, even in a world filled with hate. With your courage in our hearts, we will walk the Jerusalem road together. Amen. Our opening hymn, Precious Lord, Take My Hand.
forgiveness, but to honestly look at who we are and to open our lives to the transforming power of our God. Let us pray together. We confess to God the reality of our lives, knowing that we are loved and forgiven already. We confess that when we look honestly at our lives, we are disciples, but very poor disciples of Jesus Christ. We are not centered in our God or in our own being. We listen to the voices of the world and are misled into trying to become something we are not. We strive to please God in order to receive God's love when we already have it instead of trying to grow into what God created us to become. God does love you and forgives you freely. Know that God only seeks your good and the good of all creation. Amen. Praise, Praise God, God for the joy we know through the forgiveness of our sin. Amen. Let's be in the spirit of prayer. Gracious and loving God, your word has been sown extravagantly in our hearts, and we thank you for it. We praise you for how it lies within us, waiting for the right moment, for the right conditions to sprout and grow and burst forth into bloom. We thank you, God, for how even when the ground seems to others to not be good, you continue to sow seeds in us, and for how, in the end, when we are willing, the yield is rich. O oh God, we pray that we might be willing, willing to live your way, willing to grow, willing to produce further seed and to sow it in the lives of others. Bless today, we pray, O oh God, those we know whose hearts are like hardened paths, those who travel in rocky places, and places where the cares of this world press hard upon them. Be with all those we know who are afflicted by illness or by despair, by lack of hope, or by any of the attitudes that lead to death instead of to life. Bring your healing touch to each of them, your life-giving word and your saving love, and help them to accept these gifts that you offer. Oh Lord, we thank you for this time with you and for the strength and the joy and the peace that you grant. We praise your name and rejoice in your presence as together we pray for our church. God, give us the courage to be the kind of church you want us to be. All these things we ask you in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for her.
the birds hush, they're singing, and the man. But as an introduction, let me set the scene for you. Psalm 61 is a lament psalm. The individual lament psalms are those psalms where an individual, often David, as in this case, cries out to God about his specific, specific personal problem. In Psalm 61, David longs always to be under God's protective care and to live long so that he may daily serve God. Being far from home and feeling a tremendous need for God's protection, David expresses his desperation through several rare phrases, three that appear only here in Scripture. Heart grows faint, rock higher than I, and shelter of your winds. David believes that God will allow him to dwell near God because God has accepted David's vows and given him an inheritance, eternal inheritance with the faithful. Now it's Psalm 61. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I for you are my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me abide in your tent forever. Find refuge under the shelter of your wings. Salem. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Prolong the life of the king. May his ears endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. So I will always sing praises to your name as I pay my vows day after day. The lessons of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is Pakistani hymn me, Refuge, Saranam, Saranam. Thank you. 
Speak to us, Lord, today. Speak to our hearts. Speak to our lives. May we hear you and follow. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to acknowledge a sermon by the Reverend John Oscar called Lead Me to the Rock, which was most helpful in my preparation for this message today. Let me begin by giving you a little background on our psalm for today. A wonderful introduction that we heard. This psalm was written by King David, king of Israel. David had many children, children from many different wives. As you can imagine, this caused some friction in the home. David's firstborn son was Amnon, and Amnon fell in love with his half-sister Tamar. Instead of pursuing a normal relationship with her, which may even have been blessed by his father David, even if it was against the law of Moses, instead he tricked Tamar into his bedroom by faking a sickness, and then he forced himself upon her. After this horrifying act was completed, he threw her out and wanted nothing more to do with her. Tamar's full brother Absalom, who was David's third-born son, found her with her clothes torn, crying hysterically over what Amnon, her half-brother, had done. At first, Absalom did nothing, but for two years he plotted secretly against Amnon, until the time came when he had the opportunity and he killed him. Then, fearing the judgment of the king, Absalom fled to his grandfather's house for three years. Eventually, David relented and sent word that he had pardoned Absalom so he could return home. Absalom repaid the king's gracious forgiveness by leading a rebellion against King David. This caused David and most of his household to run for their lives into the desert. There, David ended up in a stronghold, which is a series of caves that you can use to hide in from your enemies. Now let's consider all of this. Put yourself in David's shoes for just a moment. Here you are alone and face to face with what has happened under your watch as king. Your firstborn son and the heir to the throne was a rapist and is now dead, having been killed by the same son who is now trying to kill you. The same son that law and justice had demanded be put to death himself for his crimes and yet you showed mercy and pardoned him. Because of the way you ran your kingdom, all of your officials and most of your army have apparently turned their backs on you. They are following your son, Absalom. Your people, your loyal subjects, who have loved you and supported your reign, have now rebelled and installed your son, the murderer, as king. As a result, the kingdom that God has promised you is now seemingly being ripped away from you. In one day, you've gone from living in the highest luxury as the most powerful person in the world to sleeping on a rock in a cave all alone. This is where David was at. David was filled with regret, torn apart by sorrow, carrying the weight of his failures both as a father and as king. So as an act of worship and of contrition, he wrote this powerful psalm to show us how to react when our worlds fall apart and when we are feeling overwhelmed. Here again, briefly, the first three verses of this psalm. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you are my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Lead me to the rock. Today we're going to look at David's words and see how he dealt with this terrible situation and how he coped with feeling completely overwhelmed by circumstances and situations in life. I trust that this may help a few of us who might be feeling the same way. Life in the 21st century is all about being overwhelmed, isn't it? We are surrounded by constant stimuli, 
constant news, constant information overload, particularly now in relation to COVID-19, this crisis, and it leaves us exhausted, mentally, emotionally, and most important, spiritually. This psalm teaches us several things that we can do when our lives seem to be falling apart, when the feeling of being overwhelmed seems to be choking the life right out of us. I'll admit I'm not usually much for three-point sermons, but there are three important points here about how it is that we find our way to God, who is the solid rock. Three things we can do. Seek solitude, hide yourself in God, and cry out. The first thing this psalm teaches us is to seek solitude. As in the old Calvon commercial, ask God to take you away. David says it in verse 2, lead me to the rock. For us as Christians, we find our example in Jesus. Prior to calling the disciples, it is likely that Jesus' best friend and his close relative was his cousin, John Baptist. They probably grew up playing together. They most likely traveled many times to Jerusalem for the various required feasts and festivals. They shared their lives together until John pursued his calling to leave and go into the wilderness to baptize people for the repentance of sins, and thus to prepare the way for Jesus to be revealed as Messiah. When his beloved cousin John was taken prisoner and killed by the evil King Herod, what did Jesus do? Did he preach a message on the kingdom of God suffering violence? No. Did he pull the disciples aside to tell them about the world's hatred of them? No. Did he call down fire from heaven on Herod's palace and wipe him and his evil family from the face of the earth? Matthew 14 says that Jesus withdrew alone into the wilderness. He didn't stick around and comfort his disciples. He didn't proclaim judgment on Herod. He withdrew to be with God. Now, I don't know about you, but most of the time, when I feel overwhelmed, I want to do something. But no, the Bible's answer is to stop, to be silent, to ask for God to lead you to the rock that is higher than you. When life has got you down, when the challenges keep coming and coming and coming, ask for God to take you away with him. You need time, time to process, time to grieve. You may even need to shed a few tears over the situation. Holding it all inside you is destructive to the spirit. The false bravado that we try to show when we are overwhelmed is not strength. Jesus says to us, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So once we get alone with God, we need to practice the second point. Hide yourself in God. In verse 4, David says, let me find refuge under the shelter of your wings. Or to continue the rock metaphor, let me hide under the rock. Now, coming from Maine and a fishing family, I'm thinking about how lobsters grow. They have to crawl under a rock to be protected against predators when they're ready to shed that outer shell and grow, and grow a bigger one, and then they emerge to live their lives until it's time to grow again. Or they might get caught in a trap and end up on the dinner plate. They go under the rock while they are growing their new shell. Lobsters can give us a valuable lesson. You can't hide yourself with God if you keep your shell on. What's the funny thing about us having to hang on to those self-made shells to protect us against the world? They are always ultimately destructive to our spiritual walk with God. Our shells are formed from our fear. They don't allow us room to grow. So hiding yourself in God was about letting go and letting God 
reform your shell. Your job is to let God lead you to a quiet place where you can get alone, hide yourself in the rock, in God's awesome presence, where you come to realize that God is the only shell you need. Let me ask you, do you want freedom from worry? Freedom from anxiety? Freedom from emotional pain? Make God your shield, your fortress, the source of all your strength. How do we do that? Seek solitude. Hide yourself in God. And cry out. Some people would point to God telling us to be bold and courageous so we are not to show our weakness. But God telling people to be bold and courageous was not telling them to find something within themselves that would bolster them up and give them strength. God was calling people to rest in God's strength, in God's courage. Rather than relying on ourselves, we need to turn to God. And we do that during our prayer time. Now let me tell you a secret. God is not particularly impressed with formal prayers. If you are going through the worst time of your life, or if your whole day has fallen apart, do you pray like this? Lord, thou art high above all of the earth. I beseech thee to bend thine ear of providence toward thy humble servant, born of the dust, to hear my supplication to thee. Mighty sovereign God, may thy graces overflow upon thy worthless servant, that I might lift my eyes to thee again with worship, and my heart to be filled with thy peace and blessings. I have a feeling that God fell asleep before you finished the first sentence. Maybe you should pray honestly. God help me, I'm drowning here. If you have a seven-year-old child in your care, and they're out in the backyard playing on the swing set, and you're in the house paying bills, when you can hear in the background the creak of the swing and laughter, you know that all is okay. And then all the noise stops, and you hear the back door open, and the sound of footsteps coming toward you. This child enters the room, the slight quivering lip holding their arm that has a bend in it where it shouldn't, and says, Oh, lustrous adult, may you pay attention to my plight and take it me to the nearest place of healing, so that this pain may be driven from my body and your child no health again. Isn't that a bit ridiculous? Don't you expect instead to hear, Ah, I broke my arm! But that's what we often do in prayer. God wants to hear the emotion, the honest feeling. God wants us to feel and express it. God is not impressed with your slightly quivering lip that tries to hold in the emotion and the pain. God wants to know the problem, and then it can be fixed. And that involves acknowledging our weakness. Many times, Christians act like the knight in the Monty Python skit. If you haven't seen it, there is this evil knight walking the road that won't let the hero pass by. So they both pull out their swords and do battle. The hero manages to cut off the evil knight's sword arm. Blood is spurting out all over, and the evil knight refuses to yield the road. He picks up the sword with his other hand and continues to do battle. So the hero cuts off his other arm. Still, the knight refuses to yield the road, running and bumping into the hero. So the main character cuts off his leg. The knight still attempts to do battle by kicking one leg at the hero, saying, it's only a flesh wound, it's only a flesh wound. Have you ever been there? Is that you? Are you the one who refuses to admit to God when you feel overwhelmed? Or perhaps you've even suffered some wounds in this battle that we call life. And yet, you choose not to bring them before God for healing. We need to acknowledge our weakness, our pain, and even our deepest, darkest emotions. We need to admit to God when we don't understand and may even be a bit angry. God wants to hear it. Because to be honest, 
as we know God already knows. God knows and wants to help us. But we have to confess for our own sake. We have to humble ourselves, admit that we can't do it on our own, and come to God to be ready to accept God's help. Seek solitude. Hide yourself in God. Cry out to God from that secret place, and you will know God's strength, God's comfort, and God's peace. And God will become your shell, your shield, your protection, so that you can live a life that honors God. Amen. Let's join together in a litany on God's providence. Providence of God is all around us if we could but see. We rejoice in God's loving care for us and for all creation. The care of God is seen in the vastness of space. God has given us a limitless place to learn and grow. The earth is filled with the wondrous variety of creation. Our hearts and zebras, Brussels sprouts, and yellow and sapphires, ocean depths and mountain lakes, proclaim the power of God. The human family reflects the joy of God in having diversity. Hosts of many colors, heights, inclinations, personalities, gifts, and limitations all show the delightful variety of God's image. As children within one household are different, so we in the household of God have our unique ways. Some stand, some sit, some kneel, some, some are quiet, some, some shut, some wave their hands. Some make the sign of the cross, some hold their, their hands quietly in their laps, and they all give all the praise to our Creator. The awesome creative power of God continues to call forth life and being. God is still among us, creating new and renewing the only. Even we are part of God's continuing work. God recreates us each day. Taking us from glory to glory. Amen. As we come to the time of our offering, we'll remind you that there are various ways to provide your offering to the church, as on the screen, mail your check in to the church, or go online, or drop off your offering in the mailbox outside the church, whatever is most convenient for you. And if you belong to another church, I encourage you to support your church during this time as well. Our offerings empower ministry within the congregation and in response to the needs of the community. They also help to support the work of ministries beyond the local church. Through our connectional giving as United Methodists, we support the missional presence of the United Methodist Church in more than 1,300 college and university campuses around the world where the transformational nature of Christ is shared in a way that raises up a new generation of thoughtful young people who care about making the world a better place. This ministry happens thanks to the generous support of people like you. And so, with gratitude for all that God has given to us, let us dedicate our tithes and offerings to God this morning. Let us pray. God of hope and new life, help us to see the joy and abundant life you intend for us. Grant us your peace. Peace is just not the absence of trouble, but the awareness of your guiding presence in all we do. We dedicate our lives and all that we have to the work of life, of love, and of peace. Receive our gifts today and lead us out in wisdom and courage. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn, Rock of Ages, Clef.
Like a rock, God is under our feet. Like a roof, God is over our heads. Like the horizon, God is beyond us. Like water in a pitcher, God is within us and in the pouring out of us. Like a pebble in the sea, we are in God. Let us go out and change our world as God has changed our lives.